Welcome to the Sustainable Consumption Teaching Series. My name is Philip Vergracht and I will talk about consumption and social change. So why talk about consumption and social change? Well, a lot of research has been done on ecological limits, less so on social justice, but we know much less about the drivers and the determinants of social change. Why is that important? Well, it's no surprise that many of the ecological pro uh, problems we face, such as climate change, loss of biodiversity, are closely related to our individual lifestyles and consumption practices. These practices are deeply entrenched in the society of which we are all part. For that reason, it has been called a consumer society. Consumer society has first emerged in the early 20th century, but after the Second World War, it has spread about large parts of the, of the world. It has brought many benefits, but now we become aware of its ecological consequences and its inherent and persistent inequalities of income and wealth. Still, talking about and researching ecological limits has its merits in terms of raising awareness, but it does little in finding solutions. The solutions can, cannot be found in changing individual consumption habits alone. Sure, it's important that consumers are aware and take responsibility for their individual behavior, but it's clearly not enough. And for people living below the poverty line, it's not a viable option either. In order to create effective change, we need to realize that consumption is part of a complex system and that complex systems are difficult to analyze and even more difficult to change. So what are the characteristics of this complex system? First, it has an economic dimension. Our economy is based on consumption, competition and the imperative of growth. Its main ideology is neoclassical free market fundamentalism which does not recognize ecological limits and believes that inequalities are necessary but are mitigated through growth. This economic system thus needs to change fundamentally. However, um, <clears> the <throat> economic system is embedded in politics and power relationships that are even less amenable to change. Powerful actors like fossil fuel industries and large agribusiness will not give up their privileged positions without resistance. The political economic system is supported by dominant economic curricula at nearly all universities in the world, where neoclassical economics are still being taught as if ecological problems do not exist, and by governments that are beholden to these economic interests and actors, and by consumers who may be aware but miss the possibility to change such a system. This economic and political system is entrenched in our institutions and in our culture. Existing institutions reflect the dominant economic and power relationships that are not easy to change. And the culture of consumerism, even hedonism, is so pervasive in our modern society that we have to come to see ourselves more as consumers than as responsible citizens and mindful co-creators of sustainable lifestyles. Culture is pervasive and is of course reinforced by mass media and the advertisement industry, again fueled by business interests and protected by existing laws and regulations and practices. Nothing of this is new. Influential thinkers like Thorstein Veblen, end of 19th century, John Kenneth Galbraith, Franz Packard, Herbert Marcuse, Theodor Adorno, Jürgen Habermas, Ivan Illich, Erich Fromm, and more recently Hermann Daly, Eleanor Ostrom and Joachim Spangenberg have written extensively about these and related issues. So how, how to change such a complex system? What could be the drivers and determinants of change? Would it be possible to influence change processes in a direction that is more sustainable and responsible? And what could research and researchers contribute? Collectively, researchers in SCORI have discussed these questions extensively. Most recently in a series of lectures in a workshop and 2015 in Boston. Based on these discussions and supported by our colleagues, we recently finished a book on consumption and social change, in which we analyze these questions and describe practices and experiments. We learned that small-scale social technical experiments, local grassroots innovations, transition towns, 
local agriculture and the community energy are important building blocks for experimenting with alternative lifestyles not built on present consumerist culture. However, that's not enough. In our book, we describe two important lessons from the political and historical economist Karl Perlandi from his 1944 book, The Great Transformation. The first is that we need to re-embed the presently disembedded economy, which means that the economy is never disconnected from values, practices, responsibilities, and needs to be reconnected with what we really value in life. The second is that what Polanyi calls the first movement of neoliberal market fundamentalism will evoke a second movement to counteract that first movement. But the second movement needs to be developed and strengthened through collaboration and social movement development. We thus need to collectively develop a second movement that effectively mobilizes support and counteracts the, the first movement. Individual consumers can do a lot by consuming less and better and contributing to local experiments. But more importantly, they should contribute to the building of a second movement. The research question is, how can this be done more effectively? And research efforts need to be judged against the question what it contributes to our understanding of how to change complex systems and how to effectively form and re reinforce social movements. But I remain an optimist. It's now September 2016 and we are in Budapest at the Decroats conference, which is an important manifestation of this emergence movement. I wish you a fruitful reflection on the drivers of change beyond the consumer society towards a better life for all and a healthy environment. Thank you very much for your attention.